I'd like to welcome each one of you today as we continue our series on strong churches in a weak world. And I'm not saying, you know, the world is strong and the things that it wants to be strong in, but the truth of the matter is the world is falling apart at the seams. The truth of the matter is in the things that we need to be strong in and the things that God instructs us to be strong in, our world is weak in. And what the sad truth of the matter is, is many churches, instead of standing strong and standing firm, are moving in the direction of the world and that they are becoming weaker and weaker as they do so. We've been looking at how can we have a strong church in the midst of this weak world that we live in and of course, for those of you who have been following this series, we've seen there's already thing, several things that we have mentioned. Today, I want us to look at this idea of being strong when it comes to God's standards. There are so many churches today that have compromised the standards that they have for people that serve and for things of that nature. And friends, what I want to do once again today is, is look at the Word of God and find out what God says about this matter of standards. And we'll have... Uh, two parts in this message about looking at, at standards and how can we be stronger in the standards that God has given to us. I want to begin by reading 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2. We're going to read that verse and we're going to ask the God of heaven to help us and then we'll dive right into this message today. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2, it says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Let's bow in prayer. Father and God, we thank you for today. Lord, we thank you for the word of God. Lord, thank you that we're not left to ourselves to try to figure out what it is that you want for us, what you expect of us as believers and as New Testament churches. So Lord, we pray that you help us to not be ignorant of that which you've said in your word. But God, may we know clearly what you say May we apply it to our own lives. Lord, may we apply it to our churches where need be that we might be strong churches for you in this day and age. Lord, we don't want to be strong to bring attention to ourselves. We want to be strong because that's what honors and glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. And we want to be all that you've called us to be. We want the blessing and the power of God upon our assemblies. But Lord, we know that in order for that to happen, that we must Meet the requirements that you give to us. So, Lord, help us, we pray, to be strong churches in this day and age. In your name we pray. Amen. There are two chapters in the Word of God that are devoted to describing the high standards that are there for church leaders. We're not going to take time to look at those chapters in great detail. If you do want to look at them in great detail, if you go to our YouTube page, you'll actually find a, a uh, folder on 1 Timothy and a folder on Titus. So you can, you can look at um, what we've already seen regarding these leadership positions and what these standards are. But I do encourage you to write down these two chapters that give us the standards that God has put in place for church leaders. Understand that these are standards that have been put in place by God. They are not standards that a church has put in place. They are not standards that pastors have put in place. They are standards that have been put there by God. And in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and in Titus chapter 1, we find out what these standards are. And I encourage you to carefully and prayerfully read through those two chapters of the Word of God after the message today that you're listening to sometime. And as you read those two chapters of the Word of God, 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1, you will find out this. You will find out that the standards that God has put in place for Christian workers are high standards. As a matter of fact, God's standards in many cases are higher and in some cases much higher than the standards that many churches have. So the question we need to ask ourselves is, if we want the blessing of God and the power of God upon our midst, then why are we not just simply using the standards that God has given to us in his word? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 4, 2, the verse that I read just a moment ago, notice what it says there. It says, moreover, it is, you might want to circle this next word or highlight it. Moreover, it is required. Notice he didn't say it's recommended. He didn't say it is suggested. He said it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. 
So at the very least, as we think about these standards that we need to have, we understand that the Christian workers that we use in our church, the very minimum standard that we have for them is that they are people that are faithful. And we're going to be looking at that as we move through this. But notice here, he says they need to be people that are faithful, people that are trustworthy, people that are true, people that are honest. But in 2 Timothy chapter 2, and in verse 2, Paul is instructing Timothy on developing leadership and particularly developing uh, leadership amongst the men. And he says here in this verse, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, he says, The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to, notice this, faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. He says, listen, in essence, there are some people... Now, this may sound cruel, but listen, there are some people that at this particular juncture in their life will not make a leader. There are some people that go to your church that right now you will not be able to teach them where they are, at least at the level that they need to be taught. But he said, Timothy, here's what you need to do. He said, Timothy, find the men that are faithful men. And Timothy, to those faithful men, you pour your heart and soul into those men. Timothy, you teach those men that are faithful so that they in turn can teach other people also. But notice that faithfulness is a requirement. Now come back to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And in verse 22. 2 Corinthians 8, 22, it says, We have sent with them our brother. Notice this. Notice this. Whom we have oftentimes proved diligent in many things. But how much more diligent upon the great confidence which I have in you. You see that? He says, We've sent our brother who has oftentimes proved diligent in many things. He's been faithful. He's been persistent in the work of God. Friends, Maintaining high biblical standards for leaders and workers is important for a number of things, reasons. It's important, first of all, because it's what God requires of us. But also, if you want to raise the spiritual temperature, the spiritual climate of your church, the way that happens is by having high biblical standards for those who are the leaders and the workers in your church. Friends, the leaders and workers set the tone for the church. The leaders and the workers give the example for the co entire congregation. That's why it's imperative that we follow God and that this is not one of the optional things. That this is not one of the things that we can make up as we go. No, friends, we must find out what God requires for standards for those who are laborers in an assembly and then we must go with those standards. Listen very carefully. If we want to be stronger and not weaker in this world, this is something that is imperative. If a church compromises on its standards, it's already on a downward slide. It's already weakening and will weaken very fast. Fast. Oh, friends, it's actually better to err on being a little too strict than the air on not having standards or lowering our standards. The neglect of biblical standards for workers pulls down the spiritual atmosphere and the spiritual climate of the church. Now, let me just deal with a few arguments that people have against having standards in this day and age before we get into the standards that we need to have. Arguments that people have against standards. Well, argument num number one, we must reach the heart and not focus on externals. For us to focus in on uh, externals is to, you know, for us to use standards is to focus on these externals. Well, friends, the tr truth of the matter is, when we think about reaching the heart, proper biblical standards do focus on on the spiritual qualifications. They focus on the matters of the heart. You will see that as you get into 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. Friends, I want you to understand, when we're talking about standards, we are talking about matters of the heart. We're not simply talking about a mere external rule where these are the standards that we have, and externally you must conform to them 
if you want to if you want to if you want to serve sadly there are some independent baptist churches that that is the mentality it is a mere external rule. It's not a matter of the heart. And what that leads to, friends, is Phariseeism that produces white and sepulchers. And that's not what we're about. That's not what biblical standards are for. But sadly, some churches have taken them in that direction. That these standards have just become a Phariseeism and a holier-than-thou thing. And friends, they have a form of godliness, but they have no clue as to the power thereof. Friends, we're not talking about external um, molding to make us look good on the outside. What we're talking about is we're talking about a true walk with God that produces obedience. A true walk with God that produces obedience. Come with me, if you would, to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And verse 47 says this. This is about as clear as you can put it. And friends, this is a direct quote from Jesus. He says, He that is of God heareth God's words. Therefore, are ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Wow. Stop and think about that for a minute. Let this sink in for just a moment what he's saying. He that is of God Heareth God's words. In other words, you submit to the word of God. And then he goes on to say, Ye therefore hear them not, because you're not of God. John chapter 10, verses 27 through 30. I hope you write these verses down and you take some time to read them through carefully and prayerfully uh, after each one of these messages. But John chapter 10 Verses 27 and 28 say, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. That's usually not the verse we focus in on here. But he does remind us here, friends, that his sheep know his voice. They hear him, and they follow him. And then he says, And I give unto them eternal life, neither, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. John 14, verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and he will come unto him and make our abode with him. You see that? The one that enjoys that abiding in Christ is the one that hears the word of God and listens, submits to what he is, like the word of God says. First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. We're just trying to show you here that when we talk about Biblical standards that were, it is a matter of the heart. It's a matter of a true walk with Christ that produces obedience in our lives. Second, uh, First John 2 verses 3 and 4 says, And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So when we talk about biblical standards, friends, and people would say, well, you know, we, wanna, we, don't, we must reach the heart, not simply focus on externals. Friends, when you reach the heart, what it does is it produces a walk with God that gives a person obedience. Reaching the heart does reach to the externals as well. That, but then beyond that also, we're talking about a true walk with God that not only produces obedient, uh, obedience, but it also produces separation from error and from evil. You see, friends, I can't love God and then walk in a way that is contrary to God. That's not the way that works. Let me just give you a few verses about this idea of separation from error and separation from evil, whether it be false teaching or whether it be people that do wrong. Psalm 119, verse 128 says this. It says, Therefore, I esteem all thy precepts, concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. You see what he's saying there, friends? When we understand and we submit and we bow to the fact that God's word is right on everything, then the conclusion, the, the end result of that road is that we come to the place that when we love what is right, that we hate what is evil. Ephesians chapter 5, as we think about this idea of separation from evil. Ephesians chapter 5 
And verse 11 says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Notice what he says there. He doesn't say have a little fellowship. He says have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Again, a verse that you're very familiar with. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. It says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So as we come into these verses, when people say, well, you know, we're just focusing on the heart and not really externals. Friends, when you minister to the heart, when you teach the heart, what we find is that it reveals obedience externally. It reveals separation from that which is evil. Then some people who are against standards would say, well, we can't force obedience. Well, that is true. But at the same time, the Bible has instructed us to reprove, to rebuke, and to exhort in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2. Notice what it says there. It says, preach the word. Notice he didn't say pout the word. He didn't say whisper the word. He said preach the word. That word preach in that verse literally means to herald forth the word of God. To proclaim it in a way that people can hear it. And preaching here is in the imperative mood, which means that it is a command that must be obeyed. Preaching means that we herald the word of God publicly with gravity and with authority. With the authority of God behind us. But notice what he says, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So there we see that the pastor's job entails reproving, rebuking, and exhorting. He does that through the preaching of the word of God. He does that through when he talks to people and instructs them along the line of the things of God. Now listen. The Bible says reprove, rebuke, and exhort. But to somebody that's rebellious, that comes across like force to them. Furthermore, we see here that we are to chasten and that we are to discipline. Both in regard to children and in regard to church members. Friends, God chastens every son that he receives. Hebrews 12, 6 and 7 says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he believeth. If he endure chastening... God dealeth with you as with sons, for what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Oh, it could be said that chastening and discipline is a type of force. Well, I got news for you, friend. You may look at chastening as, and discipline as force. You may look at reproving and rebuking and exhorting as force. Whatever you want to call it, friends, it's Bible, it's scriptural, it's in the Word of God, and it needs to be done. And there's too many pansy preachers today that will not do it. They like the praise of men more than they like the praise of God. Oh, friends, if that's the case with you, repent, get right with God, and stick to the book. Friends, beyond that, maintaining standards for workers is not forcing obedience. Because nobody is forced to serve in the ministries of a church. Oh, pr oh, friend, I want you to understand something. As a member of a church, it is not your right to serve. It is not something that you can demand that you be involved in service. Friends, serving the Lord Jesus Christ is a privilege. It's kind of like a driver's license. Some people look at a driver's license as whatever. But friends, it's a privilege. And in order to get a driver's license, you must meet the qualifications. And the exact same thing is true when it comes to ministry in a church. One of the most common arguments that I've heard, and it's sickening, is this. We don't have enough workers. So we just have to take what we got. We have to use what we've got. One preacher said, it's the old dilemma. Do we have a youth program led by men who are less than we want them to be in order to reach the children of our families? Or do we shut it down because there's no mature man to lead the group? Friends, let me say this. You're better off with one and only one 
Sunday school teacher, if that's the only qualified Sunday school teacher you have, than having a dozen that are not qualified. You're better off with one qualified mu musician than a dozen that are not qualified. Friends, we can't have God's power and God's blessing on our life if we're disobedient to his word. That's not only true for an individual, it's true for a church. We can't expect God's power upon us. We can't expect God to work. We can't expect God to bless if we are living as an assembly in disobedience to God and his word. Oh, friends, we're often too hasty when it comes to this matter of people working in a church. We're too hasty, and we outrun God, and we pick on ripe fruit, and we put people in positions before they're ready to be in those positions. Oh, friends, we must build a solid biblical and spiritual foundation rather than seeking to build on the sand. And building something solid requires time, and it requires patience. I've also heard people say before, well, we're going to, we want to help people grow by them being in a ministry. Friends, being involved in a ministry, shoving them into a ministry doesn't force them to grow. Involving them does not automatically bring commitment into their life. That's not the way it works. That's getting the cart before the horse when we do that. You want to make sure the Bible says they're faithful men. You want to make sure somebody's faithful before you plug them into ministry. You don't want somebody that's not trustworthy in ministry. God's principle is that they first be proven faithful and then they use an office. Come back to 1 Timothy 3 and verse 10. Notice what he says there. He says, and let them also first be proved. That word proved means tested, tried, put to the test. Then, once they've been proved and they've shown that they're faithful, then let them, notice this, use, not fill, but use the office of a deacon being found blameless. You say, why'd you make that comparison? I'll tell you why. Because there's too many deacons today that just fill an office. They don't use an office. Some of it is because some of them are not biblically qualified to even be there. He says, let them first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Some preachers say, well, you know, I get in the flesh when I try to maintain standards. Friends, a preacher needs to put the standards in writing and teach the people and then simply enforce the standards. We'll talk about that in our next message. He also needs to train up men and women of God who will stand with him in this matter, who understand what biblical standards are. And they say, yes, we're going to stand for those and we're going to use those, not because it's going to make us popular because it will do the, the opposite, but we're going to use those because it's what God expects of us and we want the blessing of God and the power of God. So we're going to stand in this matter for what is right. And, he, uh, and the preacher obtained such people by enforcing standards right from the beginning of a ministry. Then whatever workers the church has are workers who stand with the preacher on the issues because they're Bible issues. Oh, friends, it's not an issue of fighting in the flesh. If, you is, if it is, then there's something wrong in your life. It's an issue of standing firm for God's word. Not because I just want to be pig-hagged. No, no, no. I'm standing firm on God's word because I love him. And I fear him more than I fear people. And I want to build a good foundation for the house of God. And I love the people of God enough to enforce the discipline of God's word. That's where we need to be. That's where preachers need to be. And friends, beyond that, if a preacher can't do God's work without getting in the flesh, he should not be in the ministry to start with. People need strong leaders who stand firm on the word of God. Now, that being said, what are some of the reasons that we have for maintaining standards? Hopefully, we can get through this in what times that we have left. What reasons do we have for maintaining standards? Reason number one, let me give you four reasons here very quickly. Reason number one, God requires it. God requires it. That's why we should maintain standards. God requires it. 
Back in 1 Corinthians 4, 2, the verse that I read at the beginning of this message, do you remember what it says there? It says, it is required. He didn't say it's requested. He didn't say it's suggested. He didn't say it's a good thought. He said it's a requirement. God says it's a requirement. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. So I want you to understand something. That's God's requirement. It's not man's requirement. It's not my requirement. It's God's requirement. And any church leader that does not require faithfulness from those who serve and lead in a church is a pastor that is rebellious. He is going against something that God has clearly told him. Listen, faithfulness is a requirement. So for me to say, well, it's not really a requirement. I am being rebellious against God. Friends, what does it mean when we talk about being found faithful? The Word of God talks about faithful. What does that mean? Well, to be found faithful will encompass faithfulness in a number of areas. First of all, for a person that's faithful, it means they're faithful to the church services, they're faithful to church functions, and they're faithful to fellowship. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42 says this. It says, now they, if you haven't underlined these next two words already, you might want to. Now they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. That doesn't sound like a, I'll be at a church if I have nothing else going on to me. No, no. They continued steadfastly. Hebrews chapter 10. You say, I knew you were going to that verse. Well, I should go to that verse. It's in the Bible. And God says what he means, and he means what he says. Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. Statement, an assembly is not an assembly unless it assembles. Now, doesn't that sound deep? This virtual stuff doesn't work, friends. This TV preaching stuff doesn't work. An assembly is not an assembly unless it assembles. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is. He said, listen, that's the habit of some. They're, they're, they're not for, they're forsaking the assembling. And that's their habit. But don't let it be your habit, he said, friends. But rather exhort one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Let me ask you, friend, do you see the day approaching? You see the writing on the wall that Jesus Christ is coming again and it's going to be soon? Well, my Bible tells me, as I see the day coming, that I ought to be a so much the more Christian. But instead, there's, someone, there's many Christians or many that profess to be Christians that are so less the least in church rather than so much the more. And the Bible says that as we get near the end that we need to be a so much the more Christian when it comes to coming together and to exhorting one another rather than forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And friends, we're living in a day and age where we're seeing in every church around a falling away like we've never seen before. I'm seeing it everywhere that I travel. And friends, we must not forsake the assembly of God. To do so is to to rebel against God and to disobey him and God can't bless me when I'm in that situation. 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3 as we think about this idea of faithfulness to church services, functions, and fellowship. It says in 1 Timothy 3.15, But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. Statement, if you're not going to be in the house of God, why would you have to know how to behave there? No, no, friends. This verse, a prerequisite to this is that you're there, that you're faithful there. If I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou, how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. Notice this. Which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. I wish we had time to stop here for a moment. But when a church compromises on the truth that God has given to them, 
They are no longer the pillar and the ground of the truth. You should look at those words, pillar and ground there. Friends, the church is the support. The church is the foundation of the truth. The church is that which is a supporting beam to the truth. So when we do no longer are teaching and standing on the truth of the word of God in its entirety, then we have ceased to be the pillar and ground of the truth. And listen, friends, a place that calls itself a church that is not the pillar and ground of the truth is not a New Testament church. It's a social club, it's whatever you want to call it, but it's not a church because it's not standing on the truth and that's a requirement to be a church of the living God. To be found faithful not only means that they're faithful to church services and functions and fellowship, but friends, there's also faithfulness when it comes to doctrinal purity. They stand on what the Word of God teaches. Again, back in Acts chapter 2, and verse 42, it says this, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and prayers. Faithfulness in doctrinal purity. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. If the word of God teaches it, that's where we're going to be. If the, if the church covenant or church uh, um, doctrinal statement uh, or the bylaws that we have or the constitution, if any of that is contradictory to the word of God, then let God be true, but every man a liar. The word of God is right every single time. This book is our guidebook for faith and for practice. There is faithfulness and doctrinal purity. In 1 Timothy 1, 3, it says, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some, that they teach no other doctrine. Don't get caught up in the doctrines of men. Don't get caught up in the thoughts of men. Don't even get caught up in your own thoughts. Preach the word of God as it is. Jude chapter 1. In verse 3, Jude says this, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. So, friends, I'm sad to say, but there's many today that are not earnestly contending. Faithfulness in the lives of God's people include faithfulness in modesty. I'm not going to get into this in great detail today. We don't have time. I'm running out of time fast here. But notice what it says in 1 Timothy 2, verse 9. It says, In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. Not with broided hair or gold or pearls or of costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. All I'm going to say about modesty is this. Clothing is a lot like life insurance. The more coverage you have, the better off you are. And friends, all I'm saying is we don't dress in a way to draw attention to the body. We need people that are modest as leaders and as workers in our church then there's also when we talk about faithfulness there's a faithfulness in right relationship to leaders it says this in first thessalonians 5 12 and 13 it says and we beseech you brethren notice this to know them which labor among you and are over you in the lord and admonish you you catch that over you in the Lord and admonish you. How many times have people tried to put themselves over the preacher? No, no, friends, that's not the God or day. And by the way, usually people that do that also try to put themselves, like if it's a woman, she tries to put herself over her husband, ruling her husband. No, no, friends, that's not the biblical authority model that God gives. We beseech you, brethren, to know them which are labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and to be at peace among yourselves. Oh, there's so much in that verse. I wish we could take some time to actually dig into that, but I believe it's pretty self-explanatory if you just read it carefully. Then in Hebrews 13, 7, it says, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, 
concerning the end, concerning the end of their conversation. Then in verse 17, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable unto you. And then also for faithfulness, friends, that means that they're faithful in separation from the world. The Bible says in many verses, including Ephesians 5, 11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. So we have standards because God requires standards. Secondly, because the workers represent the church and how they live affects the testimony of the church. The community knows who the church workers are. And if they don't live as they should, they will bring reproach. Not just upon themselves, friends, or something bigger. Not just upon our church or something bigger. They bring reproach upon Christ. Friends, whether we like it or we lump it, visitors judge the entire church on the basis of its workers and its ministers. That's the theme of Titus 2. I encourage you to go to Titus 2 and to read it later on. But in Titus chapter 2, that's the theme. God instructs every age group in the church, old men, old women, young men, and old, young women in that passage. And the focus is on how that their lives affect the testimony of the Lord. Let me give you some examples real quick. Write these down. Titus chapter 2 and verse 5. For this cause, left uh, Titus 2, 5 rather, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their husbands. Why? Well, because God says it. But let the word of God be not blasphemed. Titus 2 verse 8. Sound speech that cannot be condemned. That he, you notice that, sound speech that cannot be condemned. That he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Verse 10, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Reason number three why we must maintain biblical standards is because having standards for Christian workers is an important important part, rather, of raising the level of standards for the entire church. It is not possible for the entire church to have worker-type standards for every member. But it is possible to require specific challenge or specific standards for those who are serving. In other words, we can't say you have to maintain certain standards in order to attend our church. That's pharisaical. But what we can say is, if you want to serve in our church, then there's certain standards. This is the minimum. And friends, another benefit of that, reason number four why we maintain standards, is because having standards for Christian workers is a challenge to the believers. It's a challenge to those who are not working. I want to be more faithful in my service. I want to be more faithful in church attendance and in reading the Bible and in getting closer to Christ. Because these people understand that if they want to serve God in any capacity beyond merely attending, that they must live a godly, faithful Christian life. Next message, we're going to get into the standards that a church needs to maintain and a little bit on how we can implement those standards. And hopefully we'll get everything in the next service. If not, we'll have a couple of more messages on standards. But oh, friends, we need churches that are strong on biblical standards. Churches that are not lower in the bar, but churches that are seeking to be all that God wants them to be. Are you a part of such a church? If so, thank God. Realize the preacher isn't harsh and he's not being forceful. He's just simply reproving, rebuking, and exhorting and disciplining us so that we can be what God wants us to be and that we could be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Lord, help us to bring our lives in conformity to the word of God. Help us to be concerned about what you say about standards, because it's something that you require, and if you require it, we must require it. And if we don't require it, we're being rebellious and disobedient towards you. And that's sin, and you can't bless sin. So God, we pray that you would help us by your grace to be all that you want us to be, that you give us the strength 
to be stronger in these areas, the determination to be stronger in these areas in our lives and in our churches. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. God bless you, my friends. Have a great day.